we are doing our Halloween edition of Minstrels and Bards, and all of the features are in costume, uh, plus many members of the audience, so that's absolutely wonderful. So hopefully I've got everything covered tonight, and we'll have a beautiful video um, to, to remember this fabulous, witchy, spirit-filled evening by. You know, thank you for coming out. It's so good to see you, and thank you for wearing costumes. Claire is here as a druid. Oh my god, look at Alan. <gasps> Wow, and um, uh, Jennifer's here is a snaky witch. <laughs> um, so yeah, fantastic, and I see a mask over there, a masked person, hi. <laughs> oh, okay. This, this get up uh, began with the mask which I uh, quickly put together the evening before Dead Poet Society, um, because I was presenting, I was reading Hopkins poetry. And so the, the entire ensemble kind of grew around it. So um, I wrote a poem Sunday. I memorized it Monday. And here we are on Tuesday, and wish me luck. Unfurl flowering. Imagine rising from earth in spring. A flower unfurling. Flora, chloris, Cordelia, lush panoply, goddesses of flowers. A visor of green ribbons and pearls. Bouquets blossoming from corset. Twirling hoop skirt. Sunflowers for Ukraine. Poppies from Afghanistan. Azaleas, hydrangeas, peonies white as newborn. Rising on a shell darkly. Zephyr winds wind. A floral Venus? A Rembrandt posy? Corsets blooming from breast. The sensuality of a Fragonard painting budding over nape. But it is me in tights and long black fishnet gloves, and I am no goddess. Imagine infl inflorescent trails, a flower is an orgasm. Why, elusive lover, pull me to you? Aging Bella in dress-up, wound with ivy, dropping petals as I go. Breathe in gardens, meadows. Let scent suffuse. Apotheosize, flora and fauna, color and fragrance, encroaching droughts, fires, megastorms, floods, melting glaciers, 
a rising ocean of plastic flowers. In your wild gardens dance, Floraline and tenai, for bees hum humming. Thank you. I've known a number of years. Um, she's an absolutely wonderful woman. I've been on hikes with her. She's a birder. You cannot walk anywhere um, in Ontario that she doesn't know um, what bird is singing. Uh, she spends a lot of time in Algonquin, uh, where her mother uh, was living, um, with her husband, Di. Um, and um, the photographs, well, die photographs birds, they are phenomenal. Um, Kate has published a number of poetry books. She's won prizes, and uh, I love her work, and I love her. And so, welcome, Kate. And uh, I'm not going to read biographies, because that'll be in the YouTube, and it's on Facebook, so... Uh, Come on up. Thank you, flower woman. We have to have sugar maple. <laughs> yes, just call me sugar. <laughs> okay, sugar. Hi, everyone. I have to get the glasses on. Okay. It's good to be here. Um, it's wonderful to have been invited to share. Is this okay? Am I too close? Good. Good. So, as you can tell, I'm manifesting my inner sugar maple. <laughs> I'm going to read seven poems for you this evening. Um, as Brenda mentioned, um, many are set in my mother's Algonquin area home. Two are set in Toronto. Three are about being my mother's caretaker at her home and two are witchy poems, and you will know which witch. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start with a short poem um, entitled Fall After Autumn by Rilke, just to evoke this. Fall, its brazen deer mice, feet scrabbling across the sky attic, the leaves blazing with the sun's hoarded embers before their fall. My hand, its dry twigs falling into my lap. No more apples to pick as the darkness tucks its blanket around the orchard. The leaves will fall. I pause to watch their lingering descent as brazen silver plates the surface of the lake. And uh, the next poem is definitely uh, set near Algonquin, the fox. She is waiting, bottom of the steps, back door, 4.30 this dark, rainy morning. My pajamas cling to my legs, wet from brushing against ferns on the path from the sleeping cabin. Her huge ears pricked in the light from my phone, her eyes glittering like mica in the quartz and granite shore. She crouches on her belly against the damp ground. The wildflowers my sister and I seeded in May needed this soaking but the fox, her patchy coat, hangs from her bones like a vintage store mink. As she waits, head on paws, her cowed need follows me into my mother's kitchen. I open the humming fridge, crack three cold eggs into a paper bowl, go out the door to the slippery deck Descend the steps. The slit of eggs sways 
viscous as motorboat oil on the lake. The fox creeps to the bowl and laps, licks her lips. I am grateful and know I'm satisfying my yearning for the days my family paddled into this place before the gravel road, the bulldozed trees flanking its scar. Yesterday, as I strode the road through the hills, I saw a downed yellow birch growing sideways, crown bright green. Its bark was old gold, tarnished, yes, but still gleaming. And uh, the next poem I will read is set in Toronto. Um, it got an honorable mention in a harbor front contest a couple of years ago and just appeared in the Winter Review. And uh, it's after an installation by Carlos Amorales. It's called Black Cloud. Ink block cloud of butterflies, a murmuration giddy as the starlings cracking their collective whip across the lake. Science has its theories about why starlings gather, punctuate the sky with question marks. The flourish of the pen they ride, that tornado, stops me six feet from the tall stranger striding towards me on the gray boardwalk. Thoughts trail me like a limping kite. When will the pandemic end so we can take deep breaths again? My sister wishes for the plague to take our species out. Droplets of pesticides sprayed on the golf course behind her house, waft on the breeze into the flight path of swallows. She found four slumped on the green on her evening walk, empty sacks of feathers, April shadows. I cannot argue with her furious sadness. Before the cold snap, I saw a yellow rumped warbler flitting through red dogwood shrubs on the Leslie Street spit, gray and black, gilded. The warbler winged north on a warm gust, guzzling gnats. As dark snow clouds mantle the woods, I want to know birds will survive the human plague. I want them to be pilgrims forever. And the next poem is perhaps a bit more whimsical. <laughs> Climate change at the dollar store, and this is definitely said in Toronto. <laughs> Rain jackhammers the asphalt. It's been pouring for seven solid days. My throat constricted around the bird of my heart. I step in the glass doors of the dollar store. A woman with black curly hair asks, will you hold my umbrella? vanishes into the store. <laughs> Amused, I hold her umbrella. Outside, King Street, the old city, absorbs no water. Storm sewers, raging rapids. The umbrella's green wingspan unfolds like a slowly waking bat clutching my wrinkled fingers. My hand aches. The woman has forgotten me and her umbrella. I shop, half watching her stomping with her rubber boots down the housewares aisle. A blue bucket catches a leap from the ceiling in the empty pet food aisle. The woman has left. I, holding a red hair scrunchie, head for the exit. The cashier mascara smudged beneath her eyes asks, still pouring? I hold out the umbrella attached to its willful spirit. Someone forgot this. After paying, I step outside, raise my bare face to the rain. There's a lot of rain in these palm jewels. <laughs> okay, right on rainy day. 
Uh, often. <laughs> okay, the next poem is perhaps a bit more somber. This one and uh, many of the poems that I'm going to read in the rest of the set are um, set near Algonquin. This is called The Outhouse. Joy flits to a twig on the sapling beside the outhouse door. Black-throated, blue warbler, indigo, shadow spirit. He plucks tiny black flies while another mosquito sucks blood from my exposed thigh. This summer's daily downpours feed fast-flowing streams. Bugs lay eggs, warblers feast. I head for the house to wake my mother, to persuade her to put on clean padded panties. I drop her soaked pajama bottoms into the washer when her head is turned. She asks her ritual questions. Why does she have to change her underwear twice a day? What is an infection? Yesterday, she called it a defection. It is a betrayal of her body. Her sheets are soaked again too. Standing naked by the bed while I strip the mattress, she points to the yellow rivulet trickling across the floor between her swollen blue-veined feet. Her pee puddles by the doorway. Yesterday, the washer overflowed. The ground is soaked. Nowhere for the water to go. The warbler lisps in the undergrowth. It starts to rain. And uh, the next poem is actually about my Ukrainian grandmother. Um, it's also about my mother and their relationship, as well as caring for my mother. And it's called Conjuring Rosalia for my Baba. At the Ukrainian shop, I buy a white linen blouse yoked with cross-stitch red and black crop circles seen from above. There's war in the country that peddled your name, Rosalia. Grandmothers starve there in ruins, dark basements. The night you passed, you slipped into my sleep from the hospital four hours away. You stared wordless in my doorway. At dawn, I woke scalded by your longing. Charoneta, witch, mother calls you still, Baba, for the sharp prick of your needle, your dying face to the wall, your refusal of goodbye as she sat by your bed. Breathless window, hovering hawk, canopy of leaves, paintbrush, pastel whisperer, asbestos breather, tip-top tailor, lung threader, muscle waster, flightless bird, wax melter, egg etcher, spell caster, hem baster, doll seamstress, stitch ripper, dreamscaper, wheeze squeezer. Your gasps bellow my lungs, Baba, catch my breaths on hills. I sketch with words the way you charcoaled fireweed, burrowing owls on the side of the barn. Charonecha, which mother named me, Baba, last summer in your mother tongue. A constant downpour dissolved the chalk birches of her forest. Every night she wet her bed. To stop the flood, I fogged her windows for two months, simmering potions on the stove. Mama, she called me Baba, as I wiped her pea-tapped legs. And this is my final poem. Um, it is, again, whimsical, because I wanted to leave you with the whimsical. Um, I should let you know there is more transliterated Ukrainian in it, but I think you'll be able to figure it out. And Baba Yaga is, uh, for any of you who might not know, is the mythical Slavic forest witch. 
And that's also my mother's nickname, one that she has embraced for very, very enthusiastically for many years. So there's Baba Yaga, and then Baba is grandmother, but Baba Yaga is like the archetypal grandmother witch. <laughs> so this is called Lost Language of Spells. One. Baba Yaga, crone child, bangs the table leaf with fisted claws. She's telling me the same story again. That Gurkha dashing round the farmyard without its head. My Baba, her mother, shouting, Pish la, Gurkha, get out of here, chicken. Though the whole point was to scald the Gurkha in the pot of boiling water on the wood stove, pluck it clean, pink as a new pencil eraser. Baika Balakati, she scolds. Do you know what that means? You are telling stories. Baba Yaga glares as I scratch in my notebook like a chicken in the dirt. I'm writing about her. How often she complains about my cooking. It's not to my taste, she says, pushing away my sweet pepper pasta. Between meals, I sit on my bed in the back room. A closed door still means no entry to her. We both are women who have lived for ourselves first. Selfish. My sister hasn't forgiven her for going back to university, leaving her with the Polish babysitter every winter weekday for two years. That dumpling woman fried pierogies every night heaped her plate until she broke my father's captain's chair. Back then, I was running through ravines, climbing trees with friends, and wearing a crown of laurel leaves. <laughs> my sister doesn't write down the stories of her girlhood, but her four full-grown children return home often to reassemble the family my sister built fresh. When birds fly into Baba Yaga's picture window, fall warm feather bundles to the cracked boards of her deck. Our Baba Yaga puts on her quilted coat, the one with deep pockets, and fills each one with a bird. Warm against her body, finches sometimes flutter back to life, flush purple as revived hearts. Two. Rescue granted her power. We know that spell. Charu Necha, you and your sister, Baba Yaga calls us witches. We are for taking her car away, refusing to drive her for ice cream because it's impossible to lick a melting heap of sweet moose tracks while wearing a mask. <laughs> the virus is a fairy tale, not real, she stomps. I challenge her to squat kick the Hopak Cossack dance. That's for men, Baba Yaga wags her bony finger at me while gnawing on a chicken leg. Her house spins once, settles on its white feathered haunches. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. I find your poems on your mother, um, once I've heard, very powerful. And the Baba Yaga poem is fantastic. <laughs> oh, I love that. And uh, you were the, the sweetest sugar maple. <laughs> so thank you very, very much. And let's have another round for Kate. And Stephen Humphrey is next. And um, I don't have the bios in front of me, so um, I, I've known Stephen maybe a decade, but I, I heard his podcast on CBC Ideas on Bees, um, and they were so good. Uh, they were just amazing, and I was just taken aback, so surprised. 
that it was Stephen who was um, the director of the art bar or on the art bar committee at the time. And, um, you know, he, he, he doesn't, like, he's got so many accomplishments. Um, so um, he does have a book right now at uh, Queens uh, on pollination. That's uh, McGill Queens. McGill Queens. That's been through review. That's what he did during the pandemic. Was was write a book. So yeah, um, his poetry. I haven't heard a lot of it. The last time I did, I remember it was quite fantastic. Um, maybe a little bit sci-fi. So we'll see what what you what you share with us tonight. Welcome, Stephen. That's fifteen minutes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, have, uh, um, yeah, I, I've been uh, working on uh, nonfiction prose for the last three years, and coming out of, well, I'm probably going to have to do revisions soon, but but coming out of that, I, I seem to be transitioning from verse into just full prose. Or at least, I just kind of stop ending the lines in the middle, I just kind of write the paragraph. But um, And a lot of what I'm doing now is kind of micro-fiction. Um, and this is actually something, I think it was published in Juniper as a poem, but it's all paragraphs. Um, Anyway, this is, uh, it recently, uh, William Shatner, Captain Kirk, um, went into space for real, and he came back, and he was dismayed by what he saw. He, he was, like, heartbroken by space. And so, this is from a dream, which is, I've always been sort of optimistic about space travel, but apparently this is what I dream about it. <clears throat> space dream. We had dinner the night before I boarded the starship. It was lovely but strange. We laughed, we kissed, watched hover cars from the balcony. I asked, would you like the dishes, the rice pot, and the cooking stuff? It's all pretty new. Soon I would be gone, and you didn't complain once, which wounded me. Next, I was alone. Stars sped past the windows, reflecting coldly from the polished floor. The ship was too big for one occupant. It's white hallways, cryptic panels, engines humming, and no one aboard but me. The colony captain was grandiose. I watched blackness speed past, blazing with spectacular stars. In my final dispatch, I announced bitterly, I paced these hallways, always arriving nowhere. Prisoner, passenger, dreamer, afterthought, cargo. <laughs> Um, and, uh, yeah, so microfiction, um, I have written like thousand word stories, and then lately they seem to be just kind of like 200 words, um, I'll have an epic for you later that's 400 words, um, but, um, then there's this other kind of website, uh, Sci-Fi Roundtable, where they have a thing every week called Best Bits, where they, it's like, give you, give us a hundred words of what you're working on. So instead of reading the stories for you, I'll just read you that a couple hundred or hundred word excerpts from Zone Boy and the Worm of Incidents. Something or someone sat across from him in the facing seat. Its ink black body was more or less humanoid without visible clothing or anatomy. It must be the creature changing shape again, struggling to mimic human form. The effort was a mixed success. Its naked feet were spatula and toeless. Its pelvis planar and ungendered, its face had no visible nose or mouth, and its head bulged with compound eyes. The over-large eyes seemed to weigh it down, its head turned with sluggish, painful effort. Did you see that? he said to the creature. Having no mouth, it didn't answer. It looked where he pointed. Um, also, I'm not explaining the story. Um, okay. And then this is, uh, I have a mad scientist character in Zone Boy called Dr. Cybrot. So, Dr. Cybrot shrugged disdainfully unbothered. He lifted his ridiculous complicated goggles to scratch his face underneath. His eyes glittered with mean amusement. He seemed content for the moment to relish her discomfort. You could at least be happy about it. 
We seized an opportunity and succeeded. Enjoy it. A smile accordioned across his face. She didn't like him any better when he smiled. It made him worse. Don't let it get to you, he cajoled in an oily effort to reassure. Small cruelties come with the work we learn to adapt. He smiled even more terribly. And I won't let you know what he did. Anyway, um, okay, so um, this is, uh, yeah, okay, so this is from a, from a story prompt. Um, and it's an article saying explorers discovered a, a mysterious, perfectly discovered a series of mysterious, perfectly aligned holes punched into the seafloor, roughly 1.2.6 kilometers beneath the ocean surface, and they have no idea what made them. And then they, the scientists thought they would ask the public what they thought it meant. Um, great idea. Anyway, so uh, as you can imagine, people, people came up with some crazy things, and what I'm about to read is not what they came up with. I, these are things I came up with, um, or what I assume people would comment on. That's where the ocean was sutured together when sea monsters tore it up, suggested one member of the public regarding the line of puckered slits in the ocean floor recently discovered by NOAA. Back in the prehistory days, sea maidens fixed everything with twine. The stitch isn't too straight because they were busy fixing things. It's where the great aquatic inchworm crawls in and out, another commenter wrote. That's how Atlantis measures the ocean. The deep state did it, ranted some poor soul off their meds. They're the perforations where superpowers divide the ocean so they can pick who gets to the sea gold. There's a picture on the website they don't want you to see because it's the graphic of the scissors, like on boxes. It says cut here. Anyway. All right. Uh, a popular fringe politician was quoted saying its target practice for the space lasers is so powerful they shoot right through the water. More powerful ones will penetrate the earth and hit China. You peel back that part so you can get to the hollow earth base, is advised some retiree. The robot with the pointy part did it, one sharp-eyed observer noted. It's right there in the picture. Anyway, um, I, the only poems I seem to write are Tonka poems. Um, and uh, lately I've been writing some of those about basically how bad I am at meditating. But um, uh, some of them, I, I do have some about bees and uh, about uh, sort of wild bees, not the honeybees. But um, some of these ended up in a uh, have, have ended up in very interesting places. Um, and the latest one is there was an installation at Campbell House um, where various artists interpreted the poems in the, these little kind of tiny dioramas, like where you could basically have B-sized sculptures in them. Anyway, um, and but um, some of these poems go with videos, which is why there's so few poems because the man hours to produce them and the video is crazy. So. Um, uh, but I was looking at one of them. The vid one of them has uh, one of the videos has been online for some years, and I just noticed the other day after my partner, who did my makeup, Christina, um, she noted that there were like twenty nine thousand views of the video that goes with this poem. So, yeah, cool, right? I've, and I didn't know anybody watched them anyway. Um, okay, so um, this is a, a leaf cutter bee, and watching it work. She just jumped around in these very random seeming ways. Um, and so I called her Gracie, um, Ode to Gracie. She buries gold and progeny in little Mayan cigars. She spins slow circles to place each leaf, but her hind twitches like a frantic leaf. Serrated jaws quiver and quiver. And in the installation, it was written on a leaf by one artist. So. Um, this one is about a male bee. You don't hear about them much because they don't do anything. Um, and so I had this, this uh, and I had a video of, of a male. If you see, if you, Toronto's uh, local bee is the official bee, is the uh, Agapostum and Viracens, the green metallic sweat bee, gorgeous metallic green, lovely things. Anyway, but anyway, this one was, I, I thought, I, I sort of talked about how he was doing nothing, but actually it turned out the poor guy was picking gnats off his body, is what researchers finally decided. So, but anyway, I named him Dexter Greenbody, so Ode to Dexter. He can't recognize his own reflection, but he still knows he's handsome. As he preens his sleek, sleek half-metallic self while the females are all below ground, forgetting him. Um... 
This one, uh, the text is actually, yeah, there you go. I know. But actually, actually, a male artist did the, the diorama for that, and she had, he had like the, the one bee that was pining for him, and there's like a picture of him with a heart on it that says Dex, but anyway. Um, this is Ode to Minerva. It hasn't been online as long, so it's only got 381 views. But, uh, but anyway, still, the, but the text is I mean, I, 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 like more than five views. I'm like, what? <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, so this is a, this is a, with a, is, is kind of like a, a um, cellophane bee, um, and it's one of the most primitive bees, so they basically look like ants with uh, painted faces, not like this, um, more simple. Um, and so they're, they're these kind of lovely black-bodied things that basically makes gauze where they lay eggs, gauze constructions. So, and somehow I, I was attracted to her mysteriousness, and so I called this Ode to Minerva. She is the secret artisan of cellophane. Her phantom face obscures dark arts. Her body is perfected to hide. She disgorges spun glass and gold from her stomach's crucible. Um, next one is about resin bees, um, which are um, similar to leafcutter bees, but they work with plant resin. So they work with this kind of just gooey, and it, uh, you know, kind of resinous stuff. But but anyway, but uh, where I was filming them was um, at this kind of installation artist, naturalist, Sarah Peebles, who I work with, and there were lots of them at work, and so she wanted to pull them, and I couldn't, like, normally I'd just do about one, but there's, like, so many of them working, and actually some of them had fights, and they'd roll around and wrestle and stuff, but anyway. Um, so I, I call this, but they were all... They're all working very hard, unlike Dexter. So um, this is Ode to Working Mothers. They push lucent white globules into cornerless walls, up and down tunnels that wind like script, parallel labor, burnt ochre through dappled windows, liquid portals. Um, and then the last one I'm going to do from this section, or this part, is um, about the, an artist at, at the installation wanted to do something with rusty patch bumblebees, which is... Um, I think you can only find them in Minnesota. Um, can't find them at all in Ontario. They used to be the fourth most common bee in North America. Um, and so I call this Ode to Missing Daughters. Um, the season starts with searching for tiny portals to catacombs of dirt and wax, where sisters strive in secret chambers. It ends where exhaustion breeds mirages, blurs of motion with ferric stains. Um, and then, okay, so actually more extinction. Um, this one, um, actually I found out when I was working on the book, which is about pollination ecology, that um, uh, there was a, a scientist doing kind of a genetic survey, and she found out that um, the KT asteroid, which killed off most of the dinosaurs, nearly killed off bees. Um, so I didn't know that when I wrote this, So, but and it's not about it. It's about, anyway, it's about what it's about. It's called KT Boundary. I remember you from the extinction event. Bright defensive frills rose like your neck had caught fire. Your gorgeous tail cut whip-like through sulfurous plumes. I could only marvel at your tongue darting as the aftershocks hit. This too, you hiss, will be forgotten. This poem wasn't meant to be about extinction. Um, it was meant to be about how when we come up with criteria for intelligence, we basically just decide what human traits animals have and base it on that. So, um, and and I, I, I kind of dealt with various animals, including humans, um, which I, I gave them the scientific name given by New Guinea cannibals, but anyway. Um, but there, there's, a, there's a type of fish off the coast of Australia that, uh, called the handfish. And they kind of they kind of walk around the, the ocean bottom and they kind of like this and, and they, they, they kind of find their way around with these hands. Um, anyway, uh, since I wrote the poem, they were declared extinct. So, handfish and squirrel. Do you know the mirror trick? Can you parse your clownish plasticine face, perplexed at this gaping, stunted body, digits like soggy feathers, useless for anything more than plodding around? empty of self-reflection through starfish and sediment. Can you do the hand trick with 
black-nailed fingers gifted at manipulation and concealment, obscuring nuts and stolen trash like privileged secrets, like privileged secrets, like the faulty permanence of possession and the gnarled inadequacy of thumbs. Long pig, what is this speech gimmick? Gills refashioned as acoustic machines, the strangled cry of landlocked fish, the treacherous tongues, mucosal sleight of hand, alveolar ejective, heart consonant, near open central vowel without specified rounding, consonant voiced, tongue near gums, short vowel, modified shifting formants. Ta da. <laughs> um, and I haven't been, I think I'm going to do the. Okay. Um, two more short things. Um, one of which actually relates a lot to the previous two costumes. Um, okay, this one is about, um, uh, from an article that said, time might, time might not exist, but that's okay. Anyway. <laughs> right. Um, so, and, and then it's sort of fine to talking about how, you know, Time may not exist as a, as, a, as a physical principle, but life is still the same. Anyway. Um, you look awful. Where were you? You may as well ask where I'm going to be. It's the same question. Don't even start that spooky talk with me. You know better than I do. Those super strings, quantum loopy loops or whatever just make up the mundane, non-interesting universe. They can't do magic tricks. This is beneath your intellect. But, but, but what? I feel it. I see it. See, feel, what? Now I'm getting worried. What are you talking about? Time. Time, right? We're talking about time. Are we still talking? Have we started yet? What? So you travel through time now. Travel. I can barely just stick with it. Every second, a maelstrom of now, then, maybe, later. It's like looking through a kaleidoscope, except new facets are made and destroyed each nanosecond. This is not beneath my intellect. My intellect barely keeps up. Oh, you poor thing. Come here. Where? Where are you? Where were you? I can't keep track. You're coming and going. Just take one step, then another, same as always. That's it. That's all. Holding tight to trust, someone steps through a quantum blizzard, each temporal grain, a tiny new cosmos. Okay. And... So this is a story, but actually I gave it kind of a poem title, which is Sonata, because the prompt was um, four paragraphs, each one based on a season. And so, but it didn't kind of turn into kind of, you know, suburban drama, sort of, you know, I forgot, I thought all about locking up the summer house all winter or something. I actually kind of just kind of threw everybody into the seasons, so. <clears throat> We were stoic throughout the winter. Each of us kept their place in our little circle. We reached through the crisp air for one another's hands in gestures of support as crystallized cold knifed through us. The soil was tough and frugal. It forced us to delve deep. We let our twisted toes grow long and wind deep down, questing for mycorrhizal colonies and caches of groundwater. Our faces were bloodless, drained of color. Our outward extremities were shriveled and black. <coughs> but frost sparkled on our skin like gems. Our breaths came slow and patient as we misted one another with crystalline clouds. We fell into dreams, eyes wide, open, focused inward. We welcomed spring in states of reverie, half conscious of the melting. We were slow to discern the still tentative sunlight a few of us hadn't survived. Their still bodies were brown and leathery, mouths agape with declarations of wonderment that went unfinished. Soon we would feel bereft, but at first we were too torpid to mourn. <coughs> when rain finally came, we felt exquisite from the downpours that inundated our nakedness. Our blood rose at the sight of one another, sheeted with rain, and our skin looked rosy. The deluge left us dappled with pin-sized buds, which blossomed into button-sized whorls. Some of us were slow to bloom. Though they were less frequented by insects or birds and their seeds were slow to spread, those that succumbed later to drought perished without offspring. Their last hours were spent berating the never-ending noise of birdsong. 
Summer oppressed us. We wilted and gasped as sunlight beat us down and smog choked us with particulate. The vulgarities of seasonal construction and the rude tumult of traffic percussed our cells in successive waves. The mating calls of creatures that circled us were lost in the din. At nights, raccoons shrieked like furies, and uncautious teams rebuked the sidewalks with vomit. We found respite in twilight when midges, mosquitoes, and drosophilia made sport in delicate clouds, where bats and dragonflies plucked them from sultry, gestural airstreams. We respired in grateful repose as the sky deepened to indigo. When autumn came, we gladly sloughed off things that needed forgetting. Our limbs were stripped full of unsightly cracks, but we were fertile, bloated with potential. We felt giddy with nostalgia as the sky turned pale. We felt each other's hands peel away finger by finger, drifting like paper. Light as snowflakes, our wind-scattered selves took flight, destined for their final concession to gravity. We littered the ground with yellow and rust, our seeds in their coats, ready to reverse winter's regrets. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. That was amazing. Such a so rich um, the writing. And I went to that uh, installation show, and it was and everything. You were on the pollinator walk too. I went on the pollinator walk. It was amazing. But those little boxes and the the videos and the poems and and the uh, embroideries. <gasps> It, it was amazing. I, I wish that we'd walked around there with the camera, you know, and videoed it, but I guess that didn't happen, did it? Yeah. Oh, and I love your face painting. You can tell your partner, especially the little brown ones mm -hmm. <laughs> the side. It was kind of uh, perfect for your reading. Was it? Okay. So thank you. Let's give it up for Stephen again. And now we have this beautiful lady. Wait till you hear her voice. Big ears. <laughs> yes, good. Okay, she's a singer-songwriter in Toronto. And um, I just kind of have got, you know, heard Clella. And I, and I did some test video of her, and I was really blown away. Um, she does a kind of jazz, what would you describe? Yeah, jazz, folk. Yeah, jazz, folk. Um, yeah. Roots. Roots is a good word, especially. Roots. Well, it's been very, very moving and interesting to listen to pieces that we've already heard. Um, my mom died about a year ago, it a year ago, November 11th. And um, I was taking care of her as well. Um, so anyway, it was interesting to hear your poems. Uh, it certainly brought back a lot of memories. And um, I live around uh, Bathurst and St. Clair area, and there are lots of beautiful gardens and homes in that neighborhood. And there's one garden that's full of lavender and this week a couple of days when i was walking out to get my exercise that lavender garden was just full of bees just if you stood still and just watched you could just see i don't know dozens of them all different i mean i don't know my bees but i some of them were bumblebees the big huge ones and the rest of them looked not quite so impressive, but they were really something to watch, and I was just grateful to uh, just be still enough to uh, hear that. So this song is called Klezmer Blues. Uh, it was inspired by Tooth Thielmans, who was a Belgian jazz harmonica player, and he covered a song called Under Paris Skies, and I heard that, and then Klezmer Blues came from listening to that one.
So you're the Klezmer elf. That's the Klezmer elf? You're the Klezmer elf. Oh, that's it, the Klezmer elf. I thought we were going to be a group called the Klezmer elf. Oh, that might work. Um, uh, I, I wondered really what to play today, and uh, I think I will play the first song I ever wrote with lyrics was, was it was quite painful. I, I, I had met someone in the family who I didn't know existed, and she had heard my album was sitting out on a counter at a store in the beaches, and she saw the name, and my name, Clela, or Clela, as Brenda's pronouncing it, or Clela, as French people pronounce it, or Kalila, as Middle Eastern people pronounce it. <laughs> my family just calls me Clee. Anyway, this, this woman came into my life, and I found out that she was my father's first cousin, and they'd grown up together, and she had been painfully excommunicated from the family, and there was all this drama. And um, I studied a photograph of my family when we were all together, before the family split up. And the song came from that, from the conversations with Jane, and looking at this family photograph where we were dressed up at a family wedding, and my little brothers were wearing little velvet suits with, sh you know, shorts, and little velvet jackets, and my sister, my mother, and I had the same hair all done up on the top of our heads, and I remembered the patent leather shoes. And Anyway, the song is called Shoulder to Lean On, and it was trying to understand what I missed in not experiencing a, a father figure. And I realized I should have plugged in the guitar, but I think you can hear it well enough, right? Yeah.
it took me a long time to be able to sing that song or perform it anyway. It was, uh, it was a hard one to do, but now I can do it. Um, I wrote a song after hearing um, Ani DeFranco on the radio on International Women's Day. And I'm not sure why exa or what exactly inspired me, but I came up with this song called Little Sparrow, an Ode to the Spring. And, and at the time, I was living in a, a second floor flat, and there was a three-year-old living downstairs, and she used to come up, and I would try to give her some sort of music lesson. And of course we did, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. So somehow that ended up in the song, or rather that a reference to that. So there's a chorus, if you feel like it, or you are moved to sing, the chorus goes like this. So now I have to get my reference here. Da 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 Up above the world so high Tell me, little sparrow, how to fly Up above the world so high Tell me, little sparrow, how to fly So that's the chorus, and that's kind of where the up above and twinkle twinkle little part came in. Anyway, here we go. Above the 
Um, the last two, I guess two days of the weekend when it was so beautiful out, I took advantage of our backyard. We have a very nice backyard. Um, it faces west and south, so we can sort of get a good... Well, it faces all four directions if you turn around. <laughs> but, the, but the best directions seem to be west. <laughs> anyway, so I do take advantage of those days, and it's fairly private, so I just go out in my pajamas in the morning and um, play sometimes. If I'm very inspired, I will play outside, to the outside. It's like I'm playing to all of you, the birds and the bees and the wind and the sun. So I feel my be at my best out there. I feel very free and that I'm part of the cosmos, if you will. So the, uh, this weekend, a funny little tune came out. It's uh, it's, it's, it's in its infancy, and it's hard to know if it's a ditty or if it's a song, but I tried to sing it to this bird that was up on top of the TV antenna. <laughs> uh, let's see if I can remember how, how it goes now. Um, something like this. Uh, hey, little bird, high up. Uh, hey, little bird, high up in your perch, singing a song. Today, hey little bird, high up in your perch, are you singing a song today? Hey little bird, high up in your perch, are you singing a song today? Hey little bird, high up in your perch, have you got something new to say? Hey little bird, high up in your perch, can you see how it all goes down? Hey little bird, high up in your perch. Can you see how it all goes down? Hey, little bird, hop in your perch. Can you see how it all goes down? Hey, little bird, high up in your perch. Can you see us down here on the ground? Hey, little bird, high up in your perch. Toronto. Uh, he's a um, professor at U of T. Um, so he's an extremely accomplished uh, and very gifted poet. Um, his last book is The Garden. And I don't know, just welcome Al. It's absolutely fabulous to have him. I'll take this off because I am unsocially distanced. Am I okay with regard to the microphone? Yeah. Yes. Sounds okay? Yes. Good. 
Well, I'm just going to read some, um, I usually think of my poems as on the longer side, and so I was determined to read shorter ones. So I have a list here from which I can choose out of this book of shorter poem, uh, of shorter poems from this book. Um, the first thing, though, I'm going to do is I'm going to read you a Halloween poem <laughs> by the great poet Robert Bridges. He was uh, a late Victorian and early 20th century poet. He's the uh, uh, special friend of um, uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins, who uh, preserved Hopkins's writings and finally printed them, published them in 1919, one of the great events. Now, it's an eccentric opinion, but I love Hopkins, but I think Bridges is an even greater poet. Um, so uh, this is his poem, Low Barometer, and it's exactly about Halloween. There's one um, egghead word in here, unhouseled. <laughs> uh, unhouseled is an old word meaning unshriven, an unconfessed crime or an unconfessed person. So um, you're under the threat of mortal sin you're to be condemned. If you die, you're not, uh, you have no right to receive Holy Communion because you're in the state of sin. That's what unhouseled means, okay? So this is low barometer. The south wind strengthens to a gale. Across the moon, the clouds fly fast. The house is smitten as with a flail. The chimney shudders to the blast. On such a night, when air has loosed its guardian grasp on blood and brain, old terrors then of God or ghost creep from their caves to life again. And reason kens he herits in a haunted house. Tenants unknown assert their squalid lease of sin with earlier title than his own. Unbodied presences, the packed pollution and remorse of time, slipped from oblivion, reenact the horrors of unhouseled crime. Some men would quell the thing with prayer whose sightless footsteps pad the floor, whose fearful trespass mounts the stair or bursts the locked forbidden door. Some have seen corpses long interred escape from hallowing control, pale charnel forms, nay, even have heard the shrilling of a troubled soul that wanders till the dawn hath crossed the dolorous dark, or earth hath wound closer her storm-spread cloak and thrust the baleful phantoms underground. So that's... Baleful phantoms. So that's uh, Robert Bridges that died 1930. So this poem is Kingdom and Leaves. Oh, I want to keep track of the time. Excuse me for a it's second. It's okay, I'm doing it. You're doing that. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, give me the, the, the two-minute warning and so forth. Thanks, Brenda. Kingdom and Leaves. A child joined these things together. The kingdom of leaves runs from the low branches in your hands up to the sky. And you can go up there, climbing the branches, and rest inside that world. The chimneys, balconies, and roofs belong to it, and it belongs to the sparrows. They are the children there. As if on lawns, among gardens, hedges, and houses, they veer in their ragged crowds through secret shortcuts. Pleasure is a maze found out in the summer dusk. And there is always one flying far behind all the others who never stop. Mm. Kingdom of evening, colored like branches collapsing in a fire. Crimson, crimsons pour from ash blue clouds, which wait now. And new cool distances, new humid lights appear from how high up and how far away sleep comes. 
here. We are as young in sunlight as the stones that will live almost forever. We are as old in shadow as the stones that have had to wait almost since the beginning. Amber lights open from time to time in a mask of cloud. Between are brown moments in the coal dust air. To cease is not permitted here. To complete something is not permitted. Out of the river climb elongated musics, oddly shaped shrieks of light, walls of brittle, unmortared bricks. Starry, staring, littered, and sunken in the hard mud of the banks, the third eyes are glass. Like water. Already when the furred solidity of peaches first meant to you a physical desire that had no outlet, the former thing had come upon your heart. Only you felt the age and the blank translucence of those billion pebbles rubbed and whispered to constantly by a weak surge. And though I wanted to make plans for you and spoke in your ear, the words were like the water that you knew, not as an emblem of eternity, but as the thing itself, tired, desperately unable to die, softening space to a silver mirror, already as old as you will have to be. In winter, the swirling tire ruts in the frozen mud of the field outside our window, these seem to us emblems of the road we thought we had been looking for and found smashed like a rusted spring. The spring is coming. We'll turn to a dawn-colored brock, these brittle sculptures the motorcycles left us as a sign for our conversion. You look across to the trees. If you are caught, it isn't within walls behind windows in the flesh. It's in the seeing that already finds beyond this another winter where the changes, though noticeable, are not of the least importance to anyone. Food for three days. Dumpling soup and sardines on crackers. Sardines and salami on crackers. The sun impassive in the wet tar. Sardines and salami on crackers. A little sugar in the canned beans. The sunset impulsive in the streaked window. A little sugar in the canned beans. A dozen peaches in a polished window. Like the sunset of morning. A dozen peaches in a polished window. Poem. The unheralded mystery of spring forces its will again on the herald flower. In the thicket, I pause to remember. February was my mentor in misery, that hollow pamphlet from yellow skies, basin of dead sparrows. I am a glove on an absent hand, and speaking, writing are nothing but the dream. Don't try to say they are anything more than dream. Whether or not there is such a thing as time, I am this window on night's senseless palette, which is already the portrait more perfect than the face. Across the torn darkness, I am this anarchic scrawl, this wake of a restless scalpel. Mm -hmm. 
I will flip far ahead now to um, another poem that's just called Song. I say flip far ahead. This is a selected poem and it's arranged, you know, um, just chronologically. Song. It does not matter. It does not matter how foolish it is. You need it to live. It does not matter how foolish it is. You need to repeat it. It does not matter how foolish it is. Begin to live again. It does not matter. Continue to live. How foolish it is. It has always been yours. It does not matter how foolish it is. Now you need it. It does not matter how foolish it is. Now you need to repeat it. Begin to live again. <laughs> Cicada. Locust outside my house, sing deep in the boredom of the afternoon. Thrust me back into the old vacant hours. Oppress no more with fact that in the empty expanse of childhood was still unknown. Prey of the wasp, grinding your wings there in the leaves. Here in the glowing curtains, don't sing of aged summer, your sexual death, but of endless brightness, saving shadow, sing deepen the boredom of the afternoon. <laughs> this poem is a little prose poem called The General. When I was planning my campaign very carefully to be invincible, designing the strategy, collecting the overwhelming force. The enemy grew so old that it was shameful to hate him. Our propaganda, our irresistible self-justification, fell on the whimsy of some old men and many more old women in that country of widows. Then we swarmed across the border, bayonets flashed through human suet, gray meat that sagged earthward and slid from the bones of its own accord. The disease and stink of that country offended our celebrations, but we held them nonetheless, having waited for victory so long. Now we possessed the field alone, and I went out into the corn, walked and stopped under the gold sky, heard the rattle of my sword, and restless clashings of dry stalks. How am I doing? Am I approaching the end now of my yeah, time? Like a okay, good. That's when I will finish with four short poems. Simplicity. The first and simplest things were best. Light, and then darkness and wind. Water, which is light with darkness for its body and wind for its blood and action. Then trees arise on its banks. Complex things and implying complexities, implying a whole earth, but staying where they are at home to pay homage to the simple. Trees arise and are unformed song, whether sound when the air stirs or the rhythm of their standing side by side in silent black or bright. Next comes one traveling, eager, a dread of what comes next, who stops under them a while, 
imagines their lyrics and imagines himself abolished in simplicity. It's in the dead of night only that you wake up, in the dark between the stars and the sun, night exhausted, dawn not yet. Only then is attention real, godlike. Then it sees how far it is from being God. It sees in a darkness blacker than the young night's beautiful color, known at last now in nostalgia, a blackness darker than light in pure space. Then you recognize the journey in which your bed is an evening's pause. It is the house of this moment in which the journey is a dream. <laughs> <laughs> Under green trees far away, the splendor, the light over everything, fills with shadows, a voice, a gesture, answering another, excited hands and eyes finding themselves, living, these dead who invented only death. Far away under green trees, what was hidden in the folds of clothing, crotch and brain glows in faces of an unruined adolescence. Every body broken, this is hard to admit. Open the door, admit the bleeding stranger, else there never will be anyone with you in your house. This is the only one there is. This is your pounding. This is you pounding, whining, cadging to be admitted. Or lying, lying there, a silence almost still, with no word anymore except your body, so that if no one will see in your body what you are saying, you will never say anything again. And like the last poem. Every step was into a new world, drenched in memory and longing. These were the dew there. The sun sparkled in it, the low sun that pierced the tips of the oak crowns on the eastern, the far side banks a sparkling that never would leave us, that later we would know again in the splendor of a breast shining in lace, the stirring of birds by the creek, the fluttering in our struck heart. The sun shone through the drops of memory and the child was wet, chilled and warmed. The child we were. He and she heard in nerves and muscles and brought their eyes close to the places they could see in the drops, some of the new worlds of the spot where we had halted for the morning. Thanks, everybody. Okay, we're... Thank you so much, Al. He didn't bring any books with him, but, you know, go buy that book at Indigo. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, next is Beatrice, or is it Be Beatrice Hausner? I hope I'm saying that right. She is was born in Chile. She is a completely bilingual. Um, she, she's had, I think, three collections published, a number of chapbooks, and she's been, um, her poems have been translated internationally. She's also an amazing translator and a very brilliant woman, and welcome, Beatrice.
Thank you so much for inviting me to this wonderful evening. I'm going to take this off because I can't read without my glasses on. You're on, right? You're on. Thank you so much. I'm going to try to to be brief. Brevity is a virtue. No, you can go 15. Okay, all right. I'm going to start with um, a poem uh, because it's nearing the time of the dead, right? It's nearing the... the the day of the dead and the day that before the dead is Halloween, etc. I'm going to read a poem in memory of my family, my my grandfather and his uncle. And as it turns out, it was dedicated to my father, but my father died too. So this is in his memory as well. It's a poem that comes from having a kind of vision at a beach on the western shores of Newfoundland called Cowhead. Cowhead. The ancestors have reached their destination. Invisible threads brought them to the sun-drenched beach at Cowhead. Ash turned to bone, molded by the hands of the silent one whose hymns dampened the wind with omens stirring bitter servings of darkness and weeping. A thread of blood pushes the pale train which never stops crossing the night. Howling deep inside the gears of the engine, tearing the tongue apart. Their story is the story of all prey caught in the jaws of the automated dog. Its mantra of death systematically repeated year after year inside the proverbial whale. Beached in the western shores of Newfoundland, its eye silently watches as mourners who shout our prayers to the north of that other season for answers. Only their muted suffering remains, ticking silently in the frozen water. These are my dearly departed, prisoners of the machine, the digital precision of their warm tattoos now turned inward, alive in this heart beating at the gates of pain. A single glass of water illuminates the world. And I'm going to read a poem, since there's so much injustice. It's called just man, and it's dedicated to Albert Moore. Mm. Ideal man never fails to turn himself inside out for love of the dispossessed. He eats bitter meals made of their detached eyes. Quivering, he listens. The murmur of their pain pounds at his temples as he grows furious, lashes at the machine, breaks down the doors, howls into the night, imploring for the great eye for answers. Hunger gnaws at the belly of children who listen to the fluttering of birds devoid of their wings. They are the echoing voices of the departed who live under ash and snow and wait for the birth of just men. And this part of my reading is all about men. So this one is called Original Man, and it's... Um, it's inspired, it's in the manner of, it starts in the manner of a great Chilean poet whose work I've translated and I'm now writing about, called Rosamil del Valle. He was immensely influential. Original man. He will come, one thinks, and the visitor arrives. He opens the door. I take out my needles. It would be useless to say that I sow myself to him because I have yet to meet his true heart, feel it like fruit that is offered, rendered liquid in a clear glass. There are his memories and there are my memories. Perhaps we are to stitch them together and display our joint selves to the judges in the audience in a city like this one before night falls and the color of our blood changes to a darker hue. Spectacular meeting by all accounts, with our attending limbs growing wilder as the ghosts of living and dead singers crowd our senses. He speaks in silence, echoing joint performances of times past when we were apt to raise our legs in tandem and write out the music of the heart. And yet he does speak the language of the worm inside the fruit, Words spoken by the wind sweeping over expanses of prairies where original man is bound with sinew, his ears sewn to the earth by the invisible hands of the great sound maker. And now I'm going to read um, 
a suite of poems. It's kind of a long poem called The Dream of Theodora. It's really about the Empress Theodora, but it kind of meshes with my own biography because I was, I was answering some questions from a friend who was, trying to, who was translating these poems. And um, when I was a child, we had to learn by heart at least one poem by a great Chilean poet called Gabriela Mistral. And she has a famous line, so it's, a, it's about girls. We were all going to be queens, that's the line. Todas íbamos a ser reinas. And in this way, I believe that we are all going to be queens, and men are all going to be kings. The Dream of Theodora. One, Theodora in Coate. In Coate, and first inside the shapes of mountains and their soft edges, promulgations of forms, their precipitous sharpness already inside her, always with gentle voice of father and of mother, who loved her and would constantly, though the ghosts were not soothing, for they announced overwhelming illuminations in darkness. Even so, the mountains persisted, taught by light and constant promise of the beyond, with snows announcing another other, and same with big people and their tenebrous inheritance of pain, forcing memorization and torment of memory of the clueless cipher. 71594. Enumerations etched by efficiency generated by early algorithms tattooed for the ages by the devastation machine. Such was demonic catastrophe, always ghostly, rubbing against the new life of parents who kept on being and non-being in crepuscular states, inside and outside the ash, the bounden reverence to fear in the chambers as the gas was inhaled for generations to come. Gloom, dance, gloom. Despite the dialectic, dialectic felicity lit there as conveyance of joy descended from frustrated, from fortunate wandering exiles who survived conditionally nestled in valleys, alive, thankfully living. Theodora Incipient, the Andes. Reminder of the littleness of childhood. Fragility because spring runoff is eternal and downward pulled by cheerful gravity, doing what gravity does, with plate tectonics interrupting the more gentle movements of the earth. All being appended with irregular frequency, the shards of glass lined the floor of the loved childhood home. The first kingdom, kingdom was a place long and narrow, with obstructions of view defining geography on the road to Theodora. Paradise was always the goal. John of Ephesus described it. All that matters is of Ephesus born, Ephesus of the mind, because the goddess is revered there despite the excessive number of breasts crowding her chest. Ephesus is Chile, an open and shut case, a country with its St. Jamestown at center, Serene town at north, Conception town middling south, and Sand Point town closest to antipodal Antarctic, with the Southern Cross replicating the morning star, illuminating all the things that were one at origin, light. Theodora forming, source. Let's speak on terms of the secret history, for all histories are secret, like the rooms where she lay as a child, listening to the sounds of the wounded animal her father rescued from a hole and carried to safety in his arms as he came down the mountain. Different beings, tenderness they were and not made of flesh and blood. Standing on its hinds, the bear roared as Theodora grew hoarse within her tiny bones, expanding the sinews in her throat, voice muscularity of voice to serve divine service of the heart to her other parts, the ones still forming together and being made by invisible hands drawing patterns of sounds, winged birds for arms, hers, legs, hers. Pliability was always the crux of the matter. There were the rhythms of letters followed one another and formed speedily and deeply, attending, effectuating, functioning, pushing sound up the walls of her mouth as she slipped on the ribbons of silken flesh, waiting always elastic with patience. The blow came down, cutting through her fear until the contortionist was formed, readying the recreation of Theodora True. 
With her father's beasts did she begin performing the shrill song, moving toes up the legs of the man who lascivious fell at her feet, walked, unwalked, the hours, minute counting the seconds inside the day until now. Merging, we become one, Theodora. Byzantium is here. Constancy shifting as bodies flow one into the other, becoming flexible, we curve under pressure and do not break. Domina. Are we done? We have maybe one minute. <laughs> okay. Two minutes. Theodora, they call me. Theodora is my name etched on the tips of these fingers by the little ants entering and exiting the book of anguish. Theodora, I am. I enter the sacred precinct, a prey space, assess guests, multicolored because they live with Isis whose name means throne. I speak of ants again because fashioned from gold and real fur, though not prickly, they pull away from the focus of my parentage. I, who am daughter of Geb and wife of Sky Heaven, remove my jewels. Tingling pendants come off my forehead as do the stacks of bangles holding these forearms, paying tribute always to the heirs of gold, of gems that are solid liquid, glittering noiselessly like powder covering skin under light. I'll end there. Beatrice reading from Beloved Revolutionary Sweetheart at Lost Launches. Um, so I think I got the book that night and I stayed up most of the night reading oh, it. <laughs> um, so Al and Beatrice are featuring either in April or July, we're not sure. Um, whatever, whenever you're both in town and available. Uh, and um, next is Maggie Fraser. Where's Maggie? Maggie, Maggie. Oh, there you are. See, I've got this one. She's, she's got a CD or an album nearly ready. She's been coming to the salons and singing, and her songs are lively and, well, there's just, they're funny and they're, they're reverent, and they're, there's, I, I can't describe them all right now, but you're going to just start singing. <laughs> I am having... Uh, and she's going to be f having a real feature, too, uh, next year. And I'm having Clela with me tonight. Okay, because, uh, yeah. I've conned her into doing it. Uh, Would you be mine in the froth and the brine as the ocean spills through the door? What if I took you and never forsook you, my fearless, my fallen amour? All of the laws that we broke for the cause, all of the pain that you paid. Would you forgive me and love me and live me, my beautiful masquerade? Would you lay back on the floor in a shack and imagine me kissing your hair? Would you be leaving me, yearn for me, grieve for me, knowing I'll never be there? All of the lies that were torn from your eyes, only to wither and fade. Would you entrance me and move me and dance me, my beautiful masquerade? And the brine as the ocean spills through the door. What if I took you and never forsook you, my fearless, my fallen amour? 
all of the laws that we broke for the cause, all of the pain that you paid. Would you forgive me and love me and live me, my beautiful masquerade? There's a song called Your Ghost, so very Halloween, I guess. Yeah. Pray for 
the soul of the loving man. yourself through I couldn't watch so I gave it to you every blow fell from my hand I'm going to hell I understand sin and in sorrow repenting tomorrow the deeds done today oh we make our bed in sin and in sorrow repenting tomorrow the deeds done today you want to so I had to burn for all my desire. You would not turn. I'm going to hell. We know this is true, but darling. Brimstone and fire, <coughs> how hungry it fries. Prison's not easy for a fellow my size. Pray for me, darling, pray if you can. Pray for the soul of your loving man. Yeah, the wild black dog 
Shenfeld, um, along with Steve Paul Sims and uh, um, Isabel Frizzyberg. So uh, that'll be a really, really beautiful evening. So hope you can come back. Raise where the minstrels and bards. Well, thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Brenda.